That's why we're here today, amen? To celebrate the life of Jesus Christ. He's the guy that was dead, that was crucified, was dead, buried. This is, the, this is the news of Easter. And he was raised to new life. That's why we're here today. Uh, for, for hundreds of years, churches have gathered on Easter Sunday and greeted each other with these words. You guys know how this goes? I say a phrase and then you respond. Do you know what's, going, what's happening here? I say, he is risen. And you respond with? Okay, we, we can do better than that. I didn't even hear Avon Lake. He is risen. He is risen <laughs> exactly. He is raised from the dead. This uh, coming back to life is what we're gathering here together. We call this resurrection. And um, actually, from the very beginning, before they even coined the word Easter, the early church called the Sunday after Jesus' death. The Sunday of his resurrection, they called it Resurrection Day. And for many people, every Sunday was Resurrection Day. And I think we get so, there are, like, there are so many movies. Have you noticed there are so many movies and TV shows that have the word resurrection? It's like, oh yeah, resurrection, I know what that is. I, I knew this was going to happen, so I went and checked on, on the internet for all these like books, shows, movies. And I couldn't even fit them all on the screen. Look at all of these movies and shows that have the word resurrection in them. And we hear this so many times. We're like, oh, yeah, yeah, that resurrection. That's that, you know, zombie thing. That's, oh, that's that, you know, when people come back from the dead. It, it's lost a lot of its punch. But 2,000 years ago, uh, when the word got out that there was some sort of a raising from the dead, it, it blew everybody away. Because 2,000 years ago, everybody knew dead things don't come back to life. Dead people don't come. They're, they're, resurrection doesn't happen. And so I want to restore some of the, the punch today. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of a guy named Ken Davis. He's a motivational speaker. A couple years ago, I heard him tell this story about this lady who... Um, who had a neighbor, and the neighbor was, and she didn't get along that well, and the neighbor had a pet rabbit, and she was always be playing with this rabbit, and one day, this, this lady looked out her kitchen window doing the dishes, and she, to her horror, she sees in her own backyard her dog with the rabbits, the, the next door neighbor's rabbit in, the, in her mouth. And she's shaking this rabbit and she's freaking out. She's like, oh my gosh, she's gonna, my dog's gonna kill that rabbit. So she runs out there, too late. The rabbit's dead. She's like, oh my gosh. Again, they, they don't get along. She's like, what am I gonna do? So she notices her neighbor's gone. So she, <laughs> she grabs this dead rabbit. It's, it's, it's covered in dirt, you know, it's all ragged. This, this, uh, this dog's just mangled it. She brings it into the house and she washes the dead rabbit, blow dries it, tries to make it look as fluffy and alive as possible, sneaks over to her neighbor's yard, sticks it in the rabbit pen in the corner, so it opens its eyes, so it's like sitting there, it's dead, but it's, she's trying to make it look alive. She sneaks back, Whew. five minutes later, neighbor comes home. She's not home five minutes before. She's this blood-curdling scream, and the neighbor walks out innocently, what's wrong, what's wrong? She goes, my rabbit! Three days ago, it died, and we buried it in the backyard. <laughs> and I came home today, and it's raised from the dead. It's sitting in the crate with its eyes open, just like sitting there. I couldn't even touch it. Ah, you know, why does that story resonate? Because dead things don't come back to life. And, and they knew this 2,000 years ago. So... There had been rumors about Jesus. He, you know, raised this kid from the dead. Oh, did that really happen? Maybe the kid was just, like, sick. But then the word got out about this guy named Lazarus. I don't know if you've ever heard about Lazarus. Lazarus is a guy who was a good friend of Jesus. And he died. And the word got out that Jesus brought him back from death. In fact, he'd been in the tomb four days the story is in John chapter 11. It's a true story. And if you've got your Bible, I invite you to turn there. Um, as a church, if you're, if you're new with us today, every Sunday we get together and we, we read from the Bible and we preach 
from the Bible. And we're actually preaching our way through this book called the Gospel of John. You know, there's four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If you've never heard of, well, you actually have heard of John. If you've watched a baseball game, you've seen a shot somewhere on the baseball field of somebody holding a little banner that says John 316. That's referring to this book, the Gospel of John. So we're preaching our way through. And this weekend, we come to John chapter 11. And uh, John chapter 11 tells the story of this friend of Jesus. Actually, let me kind of set this up for you. The characters in the story are these siblings, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, siblings. They're adults. They're, the Bible says they were really good friends with Jesus. And they show up in the Gospels again and again. You, Jesus went to their house, spent the night. Jesus uh, hung out with them. In fact, it says that Jesus loved them. So they're, they're very close. Chapter 11 starts off with these words, Lazarus was sick. And in just a couple of verses, he dies. The, the, the strange thing is, is that when the word gets to Jesus, that his friend, his good friend, Lazarus, is sick and is dying, Jesus doesn't do anything. He literally, the Bible says, he waited a couple of days. I mean, he, he's letting his good friend die. Now, come on, bring yourself into that story. Why is Jesus not doing something here. Now, you, you guys, I just told you what happened, so you know what's going to happen, but they didn't. And they're like, what's up with Jesus? Why is he waiting? And uh, Jesus says to his disciples, this is the next group of people in the story. He's like, guys, check this out. I'm, this, this, guy's not, this is not going to end in death. We've already read that he, that he died. What's Jesus talking about? And so uh, a couple days go by. Now this guy's been in the tomb four days. And Mary and Martha, they're upset with Jesus. And when Mary meets Jesus, she says, Lord, if you had been here, you can, you can almost hear the, the plaintiveness in her voice. If you had been here, you could have you stopped this. And she's implying, where were you? And uh, then a bunch of mourners come because in, in, uh, in those days when somebody died, they didn't mourn for a day or two. The whole village, in fact, some people from Jerusalem, a couple miles away, they're all gathered together. So for a week, they mourn. And they're weeping and crying. They actually, in those days, they would hire professional mourners to wail, cut their clothes, and, and, and cry and mourn. So, so with all this weeping, all this wailing, and Jesus finally, finally gets close to the town where they are. Word gets out that he's on his way. And uh, now Martha runs out there. And Jesus, his, his words, first words are, in fact, let's stand to our feet. I want you to hear these words. Jesus doesn't say, it's going to be all right, it's going to be all right, it's Okay. Listen, first words out of his mouth to, to Mary and Martha. I am the resurrection and the life. Just let that sit for a second. Not, uh, hey, I'm going to do something here. First words out of his mouth. I am. The, yes, exactly. I am the resurrection and the life. Then he says, and the one who believes in me will live even though they die. Okay, what are you saying here, Jesus? He continues, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? And Martha replies, yes, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. So a couple, couple more things happen. Let me skip down. It's a long passage, so I, I, don't wanna, I don't have time to read the whole thing. Skip down to verse 30. Um, 33, verse, verse 32, when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and she saw him, she fell at his feet and said the exact same words that her sister Martha said. Exactly. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. You would have done something, right? And when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews, that's these family and friends that will come, and the Jews there weeping together, he was deeply Moved, the Bible says. Have you ever wondered how Jesus feels about what you're going through? Remember this verse. 
He was deeply moved in spirit. And then John says, and he was troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. And then the shortest verse in the Bible, John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. Then the Jews who were there said, see how much he loved him? <laughs> but some of them said, well, great. Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Listen to these words. Take away the stone, <laughs> he said. Martha goes, but, but Lord, I can hear her stuttering, but Lord, he's, he's been in there four days. By now there's going to be a bad odor. And Jesus says, did I not tell you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God, whatever that is, the glory of God. So they took away the stone. Jesus looked up and said, Father, he's praying, I, I thank you that you have heard me. I know you always hear me, but I said this for the people for the benefit of the people who are standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! <laughs> the dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And then Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. <laughs> you may be seated. Wow! When news of this got around, it was, it was like, what is going on? And so what I want to do today is, again, it's a long passage. I want to look at three things. That's what the triangles are for in, on your bulletin and the graphics. I want to look at three things that Jesus says. There's a lot of that he says, but I want to pull out three statements and look at these real briefly because the arrows are pointing up. There's a build that's happening as each time we look at these, one of these words that Jesus says. And we'll get eventually to the climax of the story. So the first thing that Jesus says is, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and life. What do these words mean? Well, I've asked you to put this word in the blank. It seems like an insignificant word, but it's not. Because whenever Jesus says something, it's powerful. Some people have pointed out that whatever Jesus says is the word of God. Let that sink in for a minute. Jesus is the word of God. And everything he says is the word of God. So he's the guy, Jesus, who the Bible says spoke at creation, spoke, and worlds leaped into existence. Paul tells us in Colossians that Jesus, through him, everything was created. So whenever he speaks, it's powerful. And here's what he says. I am. Many people know that that, that phrase is a reference to God speaking in the Old Testament, Old Testament, and identifying who he is. My name is I Am. Kind of a funny name. I Am. I Am who I am. This is my name forever. And so Jesus, the Son of God, who is God himself, alludes to this, <laughs> but they can't really think about that much because these next words are so remarkable. I am the resurrection and the life. Again, he doesn't say, I'm going to raise Lazarus. He just says, I am the resurrection life. What does he mean? Well, let's start with this word here, this word resurrection. In and of itself, the word implies something very significant. And, and it's simple, but the word resurrection only means something in the context of death, right? You can't have a resurrection unless there's been a death. So Jesus is owning, recognizing that Lazarus has died. He's not, you know, playing games. Well, he just, you know, he's taking a nap. Or he, he's just, you know, so no. Jesus is about to speak words in a context of death. He is recognizing that we are surrounded by then and now. We live in a culture. We live in, an air, in, a, in a time where we are surrounded by, and then the, watch these words, and bound by death. What do we mean by that? Dead people don't come back, especially those who've been put in a tomb for four days. You, I don't know if you know this, but the Bible makes it really clear that death is the enemy. Don't ever 
Don't ever think that death is a friend. It's, it, God's, God, when God created the heavens and the earth, there was no death. Sin, that is humans sinning, we brought death into God's perfect creation. Death is an enemy. Death came as a result of our disobedience, as a result of our sin. And Jesus says, in the context of death, we're coming close to a tomb here, I want you to know that I have the power to eradicate death. I am the resurrection of life. And I want you to understand, I'm not going to just help you. I'm going to resurrect you. I'm going to do a resurrection here. I'm going to bring someone back from the dead. That doesn't happen. But that's, that's, he's recognizing that we live in this culture. And we're bound by it. We live in the same one today. <laughs> it's not just Jesus' day. Those of you who get up in the morning and read the newspaper, those of you who get up in the morning and click on your news feed or look at your phone, you, you can't look at the news without immediately in your face there being some kind of death announced, right? I mean, all these people died in Aleppo. This, this bomb went off. This, you know, these this terrorist acts or somebody shoots somebody or somebody, you know, there's, there's death everywhere. With news is basically what's, who's died lately. Death dominates the news. But that's not a new thing. Death is, surround, is surrounding us, and it binds us. And into that death, Jesus says, I want you to know, I have the power. He's revealing in this phrase, I am the resurrection life. I have the power to give new life. Now, that's the story of Easter. But Easter hasn't happened yet in this story. We're in John 11. Track with me here. Jesus hasn't died yet. He's not been on the cross. There's no resurrection. What's Jesus saying? Well, remember I said there's three arrows here. He is saying, I'm going to bring Lazarus back from the dead, and when I do, that's just a taste of what's to come. Because the second level, so to speak, is not just Lazarus' bringing Brad back from the dead, but Jesus is prophesying that in a short amount of time, he's going to be surrounded by death. He's describing the cross. It's a scene of death. He's describing the torturous death, and he will be bound by death. Jesus didn't die, I mean, Jesus didn't suffer and get laid into the tomb to kind of recuperate. He died. He was dead. And Jesus and, and God brought him back from the dead. So the second level, the second arrow, so to speak, is Jesus' resurrection that's coming. And he's announcing, I am the resurrection. I have the power. But thirdly, there's three arrows. What's he talking about? What's the third level? Lazarus prophesying his own resurrection, who's, who's next? We are. When Jesus was raised from the dead, he, he, he broke the power of sin and death. See, first level, when Lazarus died, well, was, uh, was raised, he's gonna die again. He, his his, his uh, new life isn't gonna last on this planet. He's gonna die again. But when Jesus, second level, when Jesus gets raised from the dead, never to die again, his death broke the cosmic powers of sin and death so that you and I could be raised. That's the third level. So we could experience resurrection life. This is what Easter's about. It's not just a historical fact. It's not just something that happened 2,000 years ago. We can have resurrection power today. Here's a question for you. Do you believe this this is exactly the question that Jesus asks, asks Martha and Mary. Do you believe this? In um, verse uh, 26, well, yeah, yeah, yes, yes, Jesus, I believe this. I believe that you, you know, are the Messiah. I believe you can do whatever you want. But what is Jesus asking us to believe? What's he asking them to believe? Again, verse 25, he who believes in me will live even though he die. Sounds like double talk. What's he talking about? He's talking about that there is a physical death that all of us will go through. Newsflash, you will die. But Jesus is saying that when you believe in me, you will live even though you die. And next verse, whoever lives by believing. So this isn't just physical life now. This is resurrection life. Holy Spirit empowered life. Whoever lives by believing in me will never die. You see, there's two levels of death here. There's a physical death that all of us will go through. And then there is an eternal death. 
He's talking about a, 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 a death that's much worse than physical. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, um, an existence of dying. Listen to those words because they're strange. An existence of dying. What Jesus is saying here, what he's prophesying, is that every single one of you in all the venues, you're all going to die. Aren't you glad you came to church today? You're all going to die, and then all of you will be raised. Every, everybody, those who are followers of Jesus and those who are not. Everybody will be raised, some to an existence of eternal life with Jesus in heaven, and some to an existence of eternal death. That's what he's saying here. An existence of eternal death. And Jesus is saying, when you believe in me, when you are raised after the end, you will live with me forever. <laughs> this, is, this is amazing. This is great news. And so he says, do you believe this? See, what Jesus is describing is a brand new kind of life. He's not just saying that Lazarus will breathe again. He's talking about an eternal kind of life, a resurrection power kind of life, a life where you are filled with the Holy Spirit, where God's resurrection power that brought back Jesus from the dead actually lives in you. Are you experiencing that right now? Do you know what it's like to have resurrection power in your life? Or... Are you just existing on this planet Earth? We, you know, we talked in the very beginning about all these movies called, you know, resurrection TV shows. Frankly, a lot of people, and, and this is true for some people in the church, maybe even a lot of people in the church, the new phrase that we've discovered in the last couple decades, this idea of walking dead, that we use to describe zombies. That actually is a good phrase to describe a lot of people. They're alive. They're walking around. They're making an income. They got a family. But they're dead inside. Is that you? Dead inside. Nobody can tell. You look good, especially on Easter. You look good. But some of you are sitting here. Fact is, this will shock you. There's a lot of you sitting here today. You're dead inside, but you don't want anybody to know it. So you mask it, you play the game, you cover it all up. Today, at the end of this service, I'm gonna give everyone here an opportunity. I'm gonna invite you to receive resurrection power. I, I, I don't care whether you're a church person. This isn't about church people. This is about all of us. I'm going to give you an opportunity to be filled with resurrection power. It's available to you. We're going to talk about that in just a second. Because this is, this is what Jesus is saying. I've come to give you a, a brand new kind of life. Do you believe this? Here, here, here's what I'm doing. I'm giving you a chance to have a restart in life. <laughs> Write that down. And then let me just kind of invite you to think about this for a second. Imagine you're, you're Lazarus. Okay, you get sick. You get sicker. You die. But you don't remember your death. I don't know if you know this, but you know, when you die, you don't remember that you died. That was supposed to be funny. Okay, so uh, wake up. Wake up. You need some resurrection power here. So, you know, he remembers being sick, and then all of a sudden, there's a, he's like, there's a gap. So when he walks out of the tomb, he's like, what just happened? Was that a dream? You know, and they're like, oh, no, dude, you died. Yeah, that's what this, these you know, linens are all about. You died. You were dead. We paired. You were in the grave for four days. And Lazarus goes, what? You know, I'm, I, I'm alive? I'm, I'm alive now? Yeah. He's thinking to himself, I get a new shot. I get a new start. I get a restart. I get a fresh beginning. All the sins, all the mistakes, all the errors, all the things he screwed up. It's like 
They died. They're over. He's got a new life. Physically, he gets a new shot. I want to love my sisters better. I want to be. I want to love God better. I want to be a better friend. I want to be a better person. I get a restart. This is what happens when you are filled with the resurrection power and life of Jesus Christ. He gives you a restart, a fresh beginning. And this is what Paul means in 2 Corinthians when he says, hey, this whole thing I'm talking about, this means that anyone, that's you, Anyone who belongs to Christ has become a brand new person. (laughs) The old gone. That's Lazarus. The old is gone. And behold, a new life has begun. A new beginning. A restart. You guys, this is available to you. That's why I want you to know at the end of the service, I'm going to give you this offer. I'm going to invite you to receive a restart. A, a new beginning. <laughs> and uh, we need a restart, don't we? Come on. I, I have experienced so many restarts in my life. Those people who come to our church on a regular basis, they've heard some stories about my past. I have a pretty nasty past. I don't need to go into details. But God's given me a restart again and again and again. I want this for you today. I want everybody here to have a restart. And a couple of the ones that I, I remember is, is when I was younger, I, I, I remember giving my life to Christ and saying, I don't really understand all this means, but I, I want to start over. And I, I got my life changed. And then I kind of got doing my own thing. And in, in high school, God exposed to me what a liar I was, what a, what a terrible person I was. And he offered me a, a new start. And I, I took it, a restart. Wow. Well, I'm not really good at this stuff. So a couple years later, man, I'm back in the hole again. And now I'm a senior in, in college. And I'm going to a Christian college. Dude, I'm studying to be a pastor. But I, I'm not walking with God. I'm going to classes about how to be a pastor. But I'm not walking with God. And, and when I go to this chapel and a speaker, kind of like what, I'm, what we're doing right now. I'm sitting out there and this speaker starts talking about the resurrection and power, the Holy Spirit and, and grace and a, and a new start and a fresh beginning. And in my heart, I'm like, I want that. I want that. At the end of the service, he said, anybody who wants that? And I like ran down the hall. I was so excited about it. I wanted to restart. And I talked to him afterwards and I'm like, I'm actually studying to be a pastor. He goes, good. You need to remember this story so you can tell people we need a restart. Amen. We need a re- over and over again, I have received grace. Because see, that's what a restart is. It's, it's grace that you're tasting again. A restart is the grace of God that's available to you. Why? Because we screw up. We fail. We sin. Even when our intentions are good. Even when our intentions are bad. We mess up and God's grace is always available. Just push the restart button. Just say, God, I, I need you. And he'll say to you, I want to give you a resurrection. I want to give you new life. Do you believe this? And you'll be at a crossroads. Because it doesn't happen automatically. You don't automatically get a restart. You have to believe. And it's not just belief in your mind. Jesus wants you to act. I think it's so fascinating that the next phrase that Jesus says in this story that we want to look at is act, asking them, challenging them to put their belief to action. Jesus says, do you believe this? And they're like, well, you know, uh, yes. She says, well, if you believe, then take away the stone. Okay, okay let's go back to the story. What, what's the stone? What's the stone? It's that big old rock in front of the tomb, kind of like holding in the dead man or maybe sealing the stink, st- <laughs> sealing the smell. It's, it's, it's dead men in there. Jesus says, do you believe? Yeah, I believe, man. We're in church. I believe. And he says, then roll away the stone. See, he's, he's asking us to put, he's actually teaching us. We must act on what we say we believe. There's a lot of you right now that, that if I asked you, do you believe? You'd say, yeah, what do you think I'm here for? Of course I believe. Then act. Get up. Move. Demonstrate what you say you believe. <laughs> because there's all kinds of unbelief. There's all kinds of excuses 
about, well, but, this is exactly what Martha says. He says, take away the stone. She goes, but, Lord, see, he's testing her. Do, do you really believe this, Martha? And the answer at this moment is no. She's living in, but, Lord, she doesn't believe. And so Jesus pushes. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't just say, I'm the resurrection of life. Okay, have a good day. He doesn't just say, do you believe this? Now have a good day. He says, roll away the stone. Act on what you believe. And I, and I, love, I love when Martha says this. But Lord, he, he's been in the tomb. I'm not a big King James Version fan because it's, it's hard for me to understand it. It's, it uses language that nobody uses today. But I love this verse in the King James Bible. Here's what it says. But Lord... He stinketh. <laughs> I, I love that. Yeah, he's been in the tomb four days. He stinketh. And so that, that kind of unbelief that I don't think that this is the right thing to do. I mean, I believe Jesus, but why do we want to move? Why do we want to roll away the stone? This is going to be bad news. Watch this. The stone represents for Martha and Mary and for you and me, what keeps us from experiencing the new life, right? Lazarus is in the grave. He's about to be raised from the dead, but the stone's in the way. So that stone is keeping Mary and Martha from experiencing the new life that Jesus wants to give. We all have stones. We all have things that represent our unbelief that are in the way. Why doesn't Jesus move the stone? Does this struck you as crazy? Here's Jesus, who's about to raise a dead man, but he asks them to move the stone. With me. Who, why didn't he move the stone? I mean, he could have just gone, stone gone. He, could, he doesn't need to move his hand. He could have just said, stone, you're out of here. I mean, this is the same Jesus that said to a bunch of people, if you have faith, you can say to this mountain, by what, what are mountains made of? Huh? <laughs> exactly. Say to this mountain, that's lots of stone, be moved into the sea. That's the guy that said you can move a mountain if you've got faith. And now, why is he asking them to move the stone? Why doesn't he just move it with a word? This is the one who spoke creation into existence. Why does he ask it? Oh, oh I know why. Jesus needs their help, right? Come on. No. Jesus doesn't need their help. Why is he asking them to move the stone? Because he's teaching them. You must act on what you believe. He's testing them. You say you believe, then let me see it. Get up, move, move the stone. Not yet. <laughs> move the stone. This is, what I, this is what I'm asking you to do. Put action to your faith. So let me ask you this morning. What stone is in the way that's keeping you from experiencing the new life? When I asked you a couple minutes ago and said, are you experiencing resurrection power in your life? Honestly, how did you answer? Yeah, man, man, I'm, I'm resurrection power coursing through my body. I'm experiencing. I, Holy Spirit's alive in me. I'm, it's, my prayer life is awesome. I, I just, I get it. Great. But honestly, that's not the way a lot of you are feeling. What stone is in the way? What stone's keeping you from the new life that Christ has come to give? Well, it's the stone of unbelief. But what exactly is unbelief? What well, shows up in all different kinds of ways. Maybe at the core of, but Lord. Maybe at the core of, I believe, but ah, is this idea of fear. If I move that stone, it's going to stink. If I move that stone, what's going to happen? Are we going to have a zombie apocalypse right here? What, what, what do you, what do you, what's going to happen? I'm afraid. Actually, fear drives a lot of our behavior. When Jesus says, do you believe this? When Jesus says, trust me, most of us respond out of fear. I don't know. So we might say something religious like, yes, Lord, but inside we're like, I'm not doing that. That's for you. That's for somebody else. I'm afraid. If I trust Jesus, what's he going to do with my life? What's going to happen? I think this is part of what's happening with Martha and Mary is it's the fear of the unknown. And with that fear of the unknown that, that causes doubt, that causes unbelief, there's another thing going on here. Do you, hear, do you hear the language of disappointment 
in, in these, these ladies' voices, Jesus, if you had been here, you could have prevented this from happening. And underneath that disappointment, underneath that I wish you had been here is kind of a demand. Why weren't you here? So the, the weeping, the sorrow is more, let me take you a little bit deeper into the story. It's more than just their brother dying. In those days, I'm, I'm so glad we're not in those day, these days anymore, but in those days, um, when an a, adult woman didn't get married, she would live with her brother. Why? Because if she didn't have a husband, she had no future. She had no way to earn a living. She had no way to provide for herself. Ch check this out. In those days, if you were an adult woman who was single, you, you may not have something to eat. So that's why she's living with her brother. That's why Mary and Martha are always talked about as being with Lazarus. He's their meal ticket. He's their provision. He's their future. And you let him die. Jesus, don't you know how this works? This is not 2017. I can't just go get a job somewhere. I don't have a future now that you let my brother die. You understand it now? So the sorrow is more than just I lost my brother. It's I'm terrified of the future. And that starts to sneak into, again, Jesus, why did you let this happen? Did you notice when I was telling the story that early on in this passage, I said, that Mary and Martha sent messengers to Jesus. While Lazarus is still sick, you can still save him. There's time. They sent messengers. Jesus, the guy that you love, your friend, he's, he's sick, he's gonna die. And Jesus did nothing. At least that's what they saw. He let him die. And I can hear in their voice, why did you let this happen? We gave you plenty of time to fix this. We, we told you with plenty of time. And there's this sneaking kind of, Jesus, if we were in charge here, you, you know, we, we would have had you come. You would have done your little deal. He would have been raised up from the sick bed, and everybody would be happy now. It's kind of like, we, if you would have done what we said, we wouldn't be in this mess. Oh, how many times have you thought that? Jesus, why did you let this happen? God, why did you let this happen? If you had done what I asked you to do, what I pled with you to do, none of this mess would be, I wouldn't be in this mess. That's that desire to be in control because you think you know better than God. Again, no one's gonna stand, very few people are gonna stand up in the church right now and go, oh, I do. But that's why we get mad. That's why we don't trust. That's why we, we kind of pull back because we're afraid that Jesus won't do things the way we want. And I like to be in control. And so very, very carefully, they're like, Jesus, I want you to have the heads up. Do something here. Uh, you're not paying attention. We, we sent another messenger. Why did you let this happen? And can you, can you feel the anger kind of rising? It's not a big leap to hear the sorrow, the disappointment, the fear, the unbelief, the desire to be in control. Why didn't you do something that kind of wells up into, you could have, why didn't you? Here's what I've discovered. This is going to blow some of you away. There's a shocking number of people in the church and outside of the church who have a deep, smoldering anger towards God. Why? Because he failed me. My past experience is that God can't be trusted. My friend was dying. The pastor told me to pray. I prayed. My friend died. My mother got cancer. The pastor told me to pray. I prayed. My mom died of cancer. Jesus did nothing. I lost my job. I prayed. Nothing happened. My past experience is that you don't do things the way I want you. See, we're right back to, oh, I like to be in control. See, faith doesn't just look at what's going on and then judge God. Faith says, okay, what's going on really stinks, um, pun intended. What's going on really hurts, but I will trust you even though I don't like the way things look. I will move the stone it's going to stink. It's going to hurt. It's going to be cruel. Who knows what's going to happen? But I will move the stone. I want to ask you this morning, 
What is the stone that you need to remove today that's keeping you from experiencing the new life of Jesus Christ? Because friends, he was raised, Jesus was raised 2,000 years ago. It's an historical fact. It is history. But are you experiencing it? I mean, it's done, it's happened, but are you experiencing that resurrection power today? Most of us aren't. See, friends, you can't give yourself life. God never asks you to save yourself, heal yourself, fix yourself. He says, just trust in me. You can't give yourself life, but you can move the stone. That's why he asks you. That's why he doesn't move it. God will do all kinds of things for you, but what he will not do is trust for you. He won't believe for you. You have to believe. And when he says, do you believe this? Then he tests you. He says, okay, you believe, then act. I, I don't want a churchy confession. Yeah, I believe. I want action. We have a, we have a phrase for this in English. What's the, what's the phrase? Actions speak. We all know this. We all know you can say something, but your actions prove what you really believe. See, we're on the break right now, friends, of experiencing a resurrection power that brings life. It's waiting for you right now. It's waiting for you, and it's available to you when you move the stone of unbelief, the fear, the sorrow, the disappointment, the anger, the desire to be controlling you. You move that stone. And when you do, you get a restart. That's, what, that's what's available to you. You get a new shot. Here's the truth of the matter. Right? A lot of us need a restart today. I, I, I want a restart. I want, I want God's grace to be at work in my life. And you can do that right now. All over our, in every venue, I want to invite you to get up in a couple seconds. Why? Because you need to act. We've just seen that Jesus say, oh, don't just tell me you believe. I know. Do you believe this? Oh, I want you to act on it. So today, I want to ask all over the place for people to get up and come down to the front, literally, and say, I want to restart. Now, some of you, what you mean by that is I've, I've been a Christian for a long time or for a while, but I've, I've messed things up. And I want to restart. It's available right now, today. And don't try to tell me you don't need one. I, we all need one. There's others, some of you, you've actually never given your life to Christ. You've never surrendered your life to Christ. You've been in control. You've been calling the shots. Today, you're here because a restart is available to you. So when you come forward, along with everybody else, you're saying, I want a brand new life. I'm tired of trying to be in control. I'm tired of calling my own shots. If this is true, if resurrection power is true, if what happened to Jesus 2,000 years ago fit, you know, works for me, I want that. I want a restart. Then good, you come down. And join the rest of us who are all coming down saying, I want some grace. I want a restart today, right now. And so... Let me, let me get, invite everybody to stand on your feet in all of our venues. I'm going to put a prayer up here that I want all of us to say out loud. Will you do this with me? All of us say these words, and I'm going to do it with you. Let's say, Lord Jesus, I want to restart today. Amen? I believe that you died on the cross to pay the price for my sins. I admit I'm a sinner in need of a Savior, and I'm surrendering my life to you right now. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. I will follow you as my leader and Lord. I'm putting my trust in you. And for some of you, it's the first time. Awesome, you come down. For others of you, you're like me. You've, got, you've had a lot of restarts. You need another one. Come down. Don't sit there and say, I believe. Act on what you say you believe. Our, our worship leaders, if you'll come forward now, they're going to sing a song that just invites you to, to come down to the front in all of our venues. And I, I invite you, when they start singing, you come down. All right? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we're, we're at a moment here where you're the only one that sees our hearts. And what you see is there are a ton of us here who need a restart. 
We, we want to taste your grace again. Some of us are ashamed that we've needed so many restarts. God, help us to put that shame aside and come running down to the front to receive the grace that's available right now and to get a restart. And there's others of us, Lord, who have been at this crossroads before. We're like, I just can't do it. I, I don't want to do it. I'm ashamed. I, I, I. God, right now, right now, may they put action to their faith. And all over Church the Open Door, may people move. Hundreds, hundreds of people moving, putting their faith into action. I want to restart. I want to restart. Give me a restart. I want grace. I want that resurrection power in my life today. And God, grant their prayers. Grant when they put their faith into action. Resurrection power. Can we pray this in Jesus' holy name?